Welcome to State of Mind. This is Julian Royce. I am so happy to bring you a new episode of this podcast, which is part of my desire to bring you the highest quality, cutting edge information and conversations to help you on your journey of greater health, greater wellness, greater sense of connection in service of us all co-creating this more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. To quote the memorable phrase from the writer Charles Eisenstein, I work here as a trauma-informed therapist, a meditation teacher, I offer psychedelic-assisted therapy, couples work, and more. You can find more out about that at astateofmindcounseling.org. I also play music, I play guitar, I DJ. I'm going to link my SoundCloud link below. Check that out there. And I'm also going to link my Instagram account where I have been more active lately. I've been sharing videos related to health, wellness, mental health, as well as my life in general. If you're finding value in this podcast, please support us. You can do that directly on our Patreon page linked below. You can also do that by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, especially Spotify Podcasts. I've been reaching out to folks asking, hey, if you're listening to this on Spotify, please give us a good review. Um, another great way to support this podcast is sharing about it on your own social media account or just sharing it with friends and family. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Harvey Schwartz. Harvey is a psychologist who specializes in treating complex PTSD, disassociative disorders, as well as patients with spiritual and therapy-related trauma. And he has undergone advanced ketamine-assisted therapy training through the Ketamine Training Center. He's now um, a teacher of teachers. He's teaching and training the next generation of psychedelic-assisted therapists. And he was a supervisor and trainer on the MAPS MDMA-assisted therapy clinical trials, MAPS standing for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science. These are the cutting-edge trials, specifically with MDMA, that have helped uh, push the movement forward in terms of making psychedelics legal, of having um, scientific, like really authentic scientific studies that validate them and show how effective they are in treating things like PTSD. This is one of my favorite podcast conversations of all time. Um, I really appreciated re-listening to it and preparing to get it published. I learned a lot from it. I would recommend this episode to fellow therapists, to students studying psychology, and to anyone who is interested in a deeper understanding of PTSD, of disassociation, and who's interested in the paradigm shift that psychedelic medicine is offering our culture at this time. Without further ado, I bring you Dr. Harvey Schwartz. today with Harvey Schwartz. Harvey, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. I'm really excited to talk with you. And I came to know of you through being a participant in the workshop you did at the MAPS conference here in Denver last summer, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science. And there were two days before the conference started of, of workshops and learning. And you led the Advanced MDMA Assisted Therapy Workshop which was such a treat to get to be there and see everyone and, and learn and hear about your experiences with the MAP studies and with your work there. And, mm. yeah. yeah, I got to co-lead that particular workshop for the first time with two of my mentors. So for me, it was a real beautiful opportunity because uh, Bruce and Marcella had been doing that work much longer than I had and in different ways. They had been my mentors as I was uh, part of the first group of therapists trained. And uh, Bruce was my mentor as I became a supervisor and mentor supervisor. So it was the first time I got to train with them as equals. So it was a beautiful opportunity to uh, to, to, to to teach with my teachers, if you know what I mean. So oh, great. beautiful! Yeah. So they were helping teach you about it when you got into. When I first got into it, yeah. And you were one of the therapists in the room with um, a patient with the MDMA trials with MAPS. Is that right? Yeah, so I was part of the first group of about 30 or 40 of us that were trained by the initial three or four people who were doing most of the research. Uh, uh, Marcella Otelar, Bruce, uh, Bruce Bolter, and uh, Michael Methoffer and Annie Methoffer. So those are the four original people who did almost all the original phase one and phase two research. Then I was part of the first group of about 35 of us who were trained. And most of us have gone on to do all the phase two, phase three research. Most of us grew up to become the next, uh, you know, level of supervisors and trainers and educators, and hmm. so we're we're sort of the next generation after them to take it forward. Beautiful, and specifically with the Maps organization. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Which which has now changed its name to Lycos, as you know. 
became a different organization. Oh, okay. Can you can you share that with us? I'm not totally up on that. Yeah, it's more probably more complicated than I want to get into right now. If that's okay. <laughs> but there, and the, the organization um, changed uh, and is in the process of a transformation um, in name and in structure. But I think the spirit of trying to move MDMA therapy into the world remains the same. And it's called Lycos. L y k o s. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, everything everything's in a state of reforming because all of, as you know all of the data has been handed into the FDA hmm. and all the government agencies and so it takes about nine months for them to review everything and everybody's kind of waiting for probably August or September when hopefully they will uh, officially reschedule MDMA. And we don't know whether they will reschedule it at all or if they will to schedule two or schedule three. And from there, the medicine will be rolled out in a variety of ways to clinics and practices around the country where people have been trained to do the work. Beautiful. It's so exciting. Yeah, so here in Colorado, we're waiting. It's going to happen pretty soon where there'll be legislative guidelines for psilocybin-assisted therapy. And um, part of that initiative that was passed here means that people will be able to access psilocybin without a therapist. They'll be able to have a choice. And that was an effort to make it more accessible, I, I think, was the intention there. So, But obviously, the FDA is the federal level, and that'll be a huge deal when that, when that happens. It seems, how confident are you that that's going to happen? The data have been so powerful and positive for the past 20 years, and so much effort has gone into it, and there's such profound need. And I think there's a strange collaboration between right-wing and left-wing people around the country around the issue of, of mental health and PTSD. And so I think because of that unusual shared mission, which in our country right now is very rare that Republicans, Democrats would agree about anything, um, I think it's likely that it will move forward. Beautiful. Yeah, that's such a good point that this is one issue where there's been there's been cooperation with people of different political stripes and that is that is a rarity and that's really cool to see and i think it makes a lot of sense and i had a um ketamine assisted therapist on the podcast who shared how powerful that how helpful that's been with depression you know in case studies where someone was actively suicidal and ketamine assisted therapy shifted that for them and that is that should 100 percent be a bipartisan thing right no one wants uh, suicide we want the opposite of that and so well, all mental health should be a bipartisan issue. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. ketamine has particular, well, ketamine is a very complicated medicine that has a diverse array of uses. Um, and it, it's particularly known for, and particularly mysteriously powerful for anti-suicidality, more than any of the other psychedelic medicines. It has many other uses. Hmm. But uh, because of that, you know, people who are in a very acute state of suicidality come into an emergency room or some other place, and you know, between one and seven days, uh, there can be a, a transient alleviation of acute suicidality, which means that in that one to seven days, not only can lives be saved, but the beginning of a therapeutic process could be started, you know, such that you know, when that initial wave wore off, there could be further use of the medicine, but also somebody may get over the hump mm. that led them to, to, to want to commit suicide and thereby engage in treatment. And so it's many uses for ketamine, but that's one of the most important mental health emergency uses now. Yeah. Yeah, that's well said. And that metaphor of getting over the hump, I think, is accurate. And that's what we want, especially when it's acute. So, Right. There's many, many people are in dark nights of the soul, alone and confused or lost for different reasons. And um, there hasn't really been anything uh, really nurturing and supportive uh, aside from you know, hospitalizations, which can sometimes be very traumatic for people. Um, and so the fact that there is a medicine that can be injected that can kind of ease the acuteness of that particular existential psychological suffering to leave room for the next phase of healing um, or perspective shifts for that person is one of the kind of uh, major miracles of ketamine, especially given that, you know, that medicine was not developed for that reason. Ketamine was developed as an... Um, uh, for help in surgery with anesthesia because it's particularly safe for respiratory issues and anesthesia. So it was not at all developed with mental health in mind. And then without getting into the full history of ketamine, subsequent um, you know, uh, observations of patients led to its becoming um, understood to have psychedelic as anti well as antidepressant anxiolytic properties and anti-suicidal properties. 
So it's one of those mysteries of medicine where something that's developed for one reason, suddenly over time becomes observed to have all these other effects called off-label in the professional world, off-label, use off-label effects. Interesting. Yeah, and that led to it being discovered as its treatment for depression in part, right? And then ultimately treatment as a psychedelic, even though it's a, a non-traditional psychedelic, it's called a dissociative right. psychedelic or dissociative anesthetic. Um, when, when medical professionals started observing what was called the emergence phenomena, I don't know if you've heard of that term, but that's the term that was initially used, emergence phenomena, probably back in the 60s and 70s when um, people in the hospital were noticing that patients on ketamine were coming out of their surgery and the surgery could have been for their ankle or for their knee with these reports of very profound, sometimes disturbing, but often beautiful, magical, spiritual experiences, psychedelic experiences. And so it was like, oh, this medicine can be used for that. And then there became a bifurcation in the field where some medical folks thought this was a problem. We better get rid of this. We have to sort of keep the benefit, beneficial uses of ketamine, uh, the, the anesthetic use, the safe anesthetic uses, and get rid of the anal the uh, emergence phenomena and psychedelic therapists or transformationally oriented folks or people used to working with non ordinary states of consciousness said, hey, aha, here it is, another medicine that can be used for transformational work in depth oriented psychotherapy. So that's what happened with the emergence phenomena, two different you know, paths of our culture. You know, one, yeah. went, <laughs> one went for biological safety and suppression and the other went for optimization of this potential. Yeah, that's fascinating. And the I just I think it's fascinating how the kind of history of our culture and science and the the role psychedelics is playing there. Our culture was so uh, materialistic and with like behavioralism, you know, in the world of psychology, we were really denying the subjective experience like altogether in, in a way that when you look back on it, it's weird. But I think psychedelics have been part of, hey, let's honor our subjective experience. Let's honor what could be called spirituality. Let's honor these other parts and there's actually value there of course and um yeah yeah well in some ways you know the psychedelic movement you know reconnected us with the wisdom of indigenous cultures practices which had been going on for thousands and thousands of years one of the reasons why i think sometimes we hesitate to call it the psychedelic renaissance is because in some ways it it disregards the fact that many indigenous cultures both with and without plant medicines but using non-ordinary states of consciousness as the primary vehicle of, of healing and community. So the combination of community and non-ordinary states of consciousness have been around for so long that um, psychedelics entered our culture in, from a variety of pathways, but one, you know, was for the Mazatec tradition of Maria Sabina. And so, you know, we, we have to remember that this was going on long before Western yeah. folks dis discovered psychedelics as a, um, a new medium for transformation and for expediting the healing and also for what would we call treatment resistant conditions. In other words, things that nothing else could treat, it would seem like different psychedelics are able to have an effect where nothing else could have an effect. And that being said, not always, not 100% of the time, but with greater frequency and regularity than any other medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating history and I've learned that you you had a long career with psychology, helping people before you got involved with psychedelics. Um, yeah. Do you want to share about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, of course, I always had an interest in the intersection of uh, spirituality, mysticism, transformation, psychotherapy, and healing. So that I, I kind of started that way as a young guy. But um, my first career was working with um, complex PTSD and severe dissociative identity disorder conditions which were only really begun, which only began to be studied and discovered really in the, in, in earnest in the eighties. And so most of the, most of the population that I work with and then began to teach about were victims of very complex and extreme, um, often bizarre and horrific forms of, of torture trauma and multiple perpetrator abuse and violation in, in collective, collective situations such as cults or criminal organizations or trafficking systems, child prostitution, child pornography systems, and um, uh, other kinds of paramilitary organizations and uh, gangs. So there's a whole population of people that our society really didn't know much about 
whose voices had never been heard were only kind of beginning to come out of the woodwork in the 80s. Remember, PTSD was not a diagnosis until 1980. So the, the legitimization of the diagnosis of PTSD in 1980 changed everything. No. Because before 1980, not only were voices suppressed, but people with, not to get into the whole history of PTSD, that's one of my big teaching topic areas, but just to say briefly, the, this means that everybody before 1980 who had any condition related to trauma and PTSD, and we're talking about millions of people on the planet, were misdiagnosed and given other medications, given false diagnoses, given inappropriate diagnoses. Once PTSD became a legitimate diagnosis in 1980, many people began to be recognized for having something other than, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or depression. And that meant our society opened the door for stories to be told and for people to be validated and for people to speak about what happened to them in ways that they never could before. And many things followed upon that. But that's so that I, my career started at that point. I got my PhD in 1982. Mm. And ironically enough, just to say, when I teach this, I always say the word trauma and DID were never mentioned once in my five years of graduate school training. Oh. And, I be, and I became a specialist in something that I never learned one sentence about in graduate school, which is just to say, we continue learning after we're in school. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes... Yeah. Sometimes we learn more on our own and learn more from our patients than we do from anything we learn uh, in school. So my career ended up, you know, accidentally entering in this in this field while it was just booming in the middle of the 1980s. And yeah. all these all these survivors started to come through telling us about mm -hmm. forms of violence going on that nobody really was tracking. Well, it's um, I imagine I mean, it's in the, sh in the shadow. People don't want to look at it because it's hard to look at. But good for you for, for doing that work. And. You had some intuition that, hey, trauma is important, and you followed that. It sounds like now it's um, it's such a big part of my world and the, and the work I do. It's amazing to remember the history that before 1980, that wasn't an official diagnosis. People were debating, is trauma or PTSD a real thing? Um, that really says something about our culture and the evolution of our culture too, right? Definitely. And so it's ironic, especially for younger people like you. I, whenever I teach trauma, I always teach, let's, let's remember the history because um, you're also used to it, like trauma is so ubiquitous, it's mentioned every day, there's so many people teaching and training, but it's only been, you know, 44 years since the legitimization of that diagnosis. And even then, it took a long time for it to be uh, recognized and for people to be trained and how to work with it. And we're still learning so many new things about the biology of trauma, the neurobiology of trauma, and moving out of like just verbal forms of therapy into all forms of, um, you know, movement and, you know, the somatic therapies and different ways to access the unconscious and, and of course the psychedelic therapy wave coming in now to begin to you know add a huge armamentarium of of uh i hate the word tools but you know of of of, of mediums through which we can help people heal not only rapidly but more deeply than some of the other methods that are available that's how that's how i joined sort of the psychedelic movement um crossing over from what i had been doing to uh, finding out about MAPS, which I had not heard of doing work with MDMA for uh, PT for treatment, quote unquote, treatment resistant PTSD. And I saw a great opportunity for me to combine all my interests in one particular field. So I kind of moved over there and I've been mostly in that work ever since 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we could just go into this point a little bit more around the history of trauma as a diagnosis, it is so much the water I swim in. It's, it's almost hard to imagine becoming a therapist, getting into mental health, studying issues without an understanding of trauma. I know that in World War I, there were sh soldiers that were shell-shocked, you know, quote unquote, and, and there was some recognition that an experience like war could have mental health consequences after it seems so obvious today. Do you have anything to share just about that history or how that developed? <laughs> I have more to share than you have time for. So it's, really big and brief. It's, it's one of the one of the things I teach a lot about. But in a brief sense, you know, there were words for people's traumatic experiences: uh, combat fatigue, war neurosis, shell shock, um, and then for women who had been uh, subjected to rape or ch uh, child abuse, or men who had been subjected to child abuse, um, the language that was used before 1980 did not have the word trauma in it. And so there was a lot of talk about people's fantasy or something wrong with them. And so even veterans who were diagnosed, there was a sign that there's something wrong with them 
that they went through this and didn't recover. And so there was a pathologizing and a shaming of all people who had been trauma survivors. And the word trauma survivor wasn't even a term. And so what, what millions of people around the world experienced and still do in some areas um, was a kind of misdiagnosis, a shaming, a naming, uh, a shaming, a blaming, and almost as if, because not everybody who went through these experiences seems to be having severe symptoms, there must be something wrong with you for having it. And there was no, no knowledge of trauma whatsoever. There was just no understanding of it. And then really Judith Herman's book, probably in 1992, Trauma and Recovery, which is probably mandatory reading now in almost every graduate program, um, you know, outlines the basic uh, beginning of bringing you know, sophisticated trauma theory into the, into the mainstream and mental health world. But even in the 80s, there really you know, wasn't a, a, you know, such a large compendium of work. Um, so yeah. the idea that the idea that the individual was blamed for their problem mm. and that the, the societal conditions that caused it were never included in mm. the uh, understand meant that all survivors of trauma were now having a double or triple trauma. What they went through, how it was misperceived, how it was misdiagnosed, and now they were shamed and blamed for what they went through. Mm. So the probability that any of them would get any healing and the probability that any of their stories would be told was highly likely before 1980. Hmm. It's an amazing history and a tragic one. Do you, I know we don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but any thoughts to share with us about just the development, the evolution, so to speak, of our culture, the reasons why it, there was so much resistance to understanding this, which seems so obvious to us today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I think Judith Herman uh, articulates it really well in her book, her classic book. She talks about the pendulum that swings around societal recognition of trauma. Then it goes from periods of like open and awareness through periods of backlash and shutdown. And if we study the individual person, like the individual trauma survivor, they too always experience an inner fluctuation between acknowledging, admitting, and recognizing the trauma and shutting it down, covering it up and going back underground. And so every individual goes through this cycle and she identified it was a collective universal, you know, ubiquitous problem. Uh, for societies. And so we have this strange kind of parallel process between the individual trying to work their way out of uh, PTSD and the collective going through periods of not wanting to know that this happened. Because once you know what's going on, you are now confronted with so many challenges to face existential spiritual challenges about what humans are capable of or what happened in your family that you might not have faced. And so you know, the revelation of trauma is a shattering right. of pe people's previously held belief systems or ideals or religious beliefs. Um, you know, we have to remember that a large portion of the American public does not believe the Holocaust happens. We are already having, right? right? So we already are seeing the backlash around, you know, historic events that have massive documentation. And so I just think it's some bizarre human phenomena around the inability to integrate shadow and light about the human experience itself. And the danger, of course, is that history will repeat itself until, okay. you, until humanity can hold shadow and light together about ourselves, what we're capable of, and take responsibility for cleaning up the messes we made, whether it's environmental or psychological or economic. Um, we're gonna continue to go through fluctuations of you know, revelation and then suppression, revelation and then suppression. So it's, it seems to be built into the fabric of the human condition. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's so interesting to make these connections between, between the individual journey and the societal. And there's clearly a lot there. Um, good to make the distinction too. They're not the same, of course, but yeah, so much of my work with clients will often be if there's some belief or sense of there's something wrong with me, whether it's my fault or that shame or blame or guilt and how to heal that, how to change that belief and perspective. And That's the hardest part of trauma work, right? Because that belief is inculcated by the society, by almost all perpetrators, and children underneath the age of, let's say children beneath the age of eight or 10, because of you know what you know about developmental psychology, right? The cognitive capacity for children to make sense of the world, pretty much before the age of eight or 10 is only kind of an egocentric ability to say, this was my fault, I caused it, or I'm the reason why something happened. So if children by their very nature can only understand negative experiences that happen by virtue of their limited cognition as I must have caused it, I must have done something wrong, something was wrong with me. And 
the people who are harming them are saying them to them. Mm -hmm. And when and when they try to reveal it to somebody, they get shut down. And the society has been shaming and blaming trauma survivors for decades. You can see that there's like compound multiple forces that are reinforcing somebody's belief that they caused it. And so when something's embedded that deeply in the unconscious, regular verbal psychotherapy doesn't usually access the deeply held somatic and, and, and unconscious belief that I cause it, I'm awful, I made it happen, there's something wrong with me. But psychedelics, <laughs> and this, is where, this is where the drum roll for psychedelics, <laughs> you know, not that they're the magic pill or the magic bullet, but they seem to have the power to bring connection between the conscious and unconscious and between the, the spirit or mysterious uh, interdimensional um, whatever word you want to use, the phenomenological world, the mystical world, the spiritual world, and connect these things that had been previously disconnected, and with therapists who know how to steward this work, such that uh, embedded belief systems can get broken apart and accessed and released in a way through the body and through relationship in a way that very few other medicines can do. And remember that most of our medicines are suppressive in nature, right? They, they kind of suppress symptoms or soften symptoms. That's mostly what Western pharmaceuticals are all about. But the psychedelic therapy movement is all about evoking, revealing, mm -hmm. and tracking and processing, right? They actually facilitate processing, they don't suppress symptoms. And so this is a huge paradigm shift in mental health. And Scott Shannon, who's a, a neighbor of yours in Colorado, has written a beautiful article uh, called Ketamine, um, a Catalyst for a Paradigm Shift in Mental Health in a recent article on a beautiful, beautiful paper he wrote uh, describing this shift in mental health itself that psychedelics and particularly ketamine bring from a suppressive symptom oriented to an evocative kind of evolving, releasing, healing, transformational view of mental health. And it's a radical shift going on in our field right now. Mm, I love that. That's so important. I think that's a great perspective to share and part of the power and promise of psychedelic therapy. And that's, that's a huge difference between suppressing and um, you actually evoking, actually going into the difficulty, the pain, so that it can be healed on a deeper level instead of trying to manage the symptoms. But remember, and this gets into the complexity of economics, right? Our complete, let's say, say the pharmaceutical industrial complex and the medical system and all the doctors being trained are oriented towards mollifying, medicating symptoms and symptom relief and symptom suppression. And now we have this whole new movement, right? <clears throat> That's really not new at all because indigenous medicine has always used this idea of evoking, releasing, accessing, and communal holding of the individual. Um, so now we have this new model and I think the models are in collision right now. And they're in collision philosophically, they're in collision in different fields, psychology, medicine, but they're also gonna be in collision uh, in terms of the financial realities of you know, an old system based on suppression and taking a pill every day versus a new system based on not having to take a pill very often, but you know, creating a relationally safe, secure space for people to actually go so deep into themselves that they can, what I would say, find the shrapnel of trauma and release it. And the main shrapnel of trauma, they got you and I into this, by the way, was shrapnel such as, I caused this, I made it happen, I'm bad and deep feelings of shame and unworthiness that all trauma survivors feel uh, because of all the compound influences that make that happen. And so verbal, regular psychotherapy is hard to reach something, you know, even if somebody knows, I know I didn't cause it, I know I'm a good person, but deep down embedded, there's still a holding pattern. And psychedelics loosen up that holding pattern mm. in a really interesting way, neurobiologically, emotionally, when done in a context of a really safe, secure, wise psychotherapy. And so no longer does the person feel held hostage to these unconscious pieces of shrapnel from the trauma, because they themselves are connected to their own healing, inner healing intelligence, not just the authority of the therapist or the authority of a drug. And they themselves begin to work out a deeper truth about who they really are, not, not just defined by the trauma, who they are spiritually. And suddenly these very deeply held beliefs begin to become no longer like the dominating force in their psychic lives. There may be a period where the old beliefs and the new beliefs battle it out, do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. after, after a session, you can have a big revelation of uh, a new perspective. And sometimes the old goes back and forth for a while with the new, 
but at least the like very embedded old belief or feeling or trauma memory or secret or uh, mm. you know, is coming out from its kind of being held stuck in the psyche. Yeah, that's so well said. Yeah, it's so, so important to share that with people. You're really doing a good job of putting it in this bigger context and understanding the power and potential of psychedelic healing. And that paradigm shift is huge. I think that's that's inspiring to hear about. I think there is a kind of battle. I think there's a place for pharmaceuticals, of course, and um, antidepressants and all that. But the the paradigm, the underlying understanding of what mental health means, of what health means. You know, I, I don't even like to talk about mental health per se, because it sounds like it's something different than, than health per se. It's like, it's just health and wellness and healing. And, and I think we're a little bit too divided at times. So with all the categories of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all those categories have pejorative aspects. And if we say mental well-being, we have the word being, well-being. And so we're already defining a person as a being, mm -hmm. and creating a space for them to be treated as something more than an object. And without getting into this, like many, we can go down many side roads because of what we're talking about. Yeah. But the, the side road I want to just mention is the way in which, you know, millions of people have been treated like objects in the medical and mental health system. And the way people have been trained, unfortunately, in medical school and other schools to look at human beings as objects, to be technically worked on and, and, and chemicals to be put into them, to control them, to mollify symptoms and human subjectivity human spirituality, the essence of humanity, existential, spiritual, phenomenological elements of a human being have not ever been fully um, taken into account in Western medicine. And so now the psychedelic movement is coming in and pushing things in this other direction. And it's, uh, you know, it encounters many obstacles, right? In the 60s, it encountered many obstacles because the liberatory potential that LSD had in the 60s on our society was radical. Remember, 4 million people had done LSD by 1969. Wow. You realize, you realize yeah. what that means? 4 million people by 1969 had done LSD. So, you know, the cat got out of the bag, so to speak. And I believe, and many other people believe, that many of the transformations we began to see in our society were fueled by this injection of this, this kind of, you know, massive access to non ordinary states of consciousness in a society where people had no no previous stewardship or access to that. And of course, we didn't exactly know what to do with it because there were no elders or no, you know, wise ones to hold it the way indigenous cultures have for thousands of years. There's always people who hold those traditions. And so things went a bit haywire. And then also the politics came in because you know, the, the, the government or the powers that be did not want to see revolution <laughs> happen. <laughs> they didn't, so, so all these medicines were used as a political weapon against, uh, you know, against, um, people of color and against political left leaning people to suppress their uh, access to, you know, public demonstrations and to, to make them uh, enemies of the state, more or less, and use, using LSD and using other drugs to categorize people as enemies of the state and to propagandize this to the, to the media. And so we had this horrible backlash and lost like 40 years of research and training and practice because of Richard Dixon's rescheduling of all these medicines as a political act to suppress, uh, you know, under the guise of protecting the people, you know, under the guise of protecting America from drugs, actually was a major assault on, on, on the black and the politically leftist communities in America. And the damage, as you know, has been done because we have massive incarceration of African Americans in the United States and other people of color that are still a legacy of the use of the drug wars to, to under the guise of public protection yeah to incarcerate people and not heal them and not help them and so we have so many decades to recover from and so the, remember remember this the new psychedelic movement which everybody's excited about is we have to remember our history right we're coming into a collision between the old paradigm and the new and i think if we're not careful and for, we don't if we forget our history this new movement could get swallowed up mm -hmm. in the old in the old paradigm mm -hmm. that's fascinating yeah the history it's heavy um Really heavy. I think um, one thing that came to my mind as you were sharing that was just how important having a good conceptual understanding actually is, having some sense of roadmap. And I, I can't really imagine what it would be like to take something like LSD with no 
idea or understanding of what it is. Like the people in the sixties, like it was so new and culturally it was completely new. Um, but now, especially with in the context of healing and ceremonial work and psychedelic assisted therapy to understand that you're entering this experience and why you're doing it. That's what the set and setting was about, of course, but that's, that piece is so important because however profound we're altering the experiences, then when you're coming back, you want to be able to make sense of it and integrate it with your life. And you need to have that kind of understanding and roadmaps to do that. Yes. Yes. And while I agree like 90% of what you're saying, Right. And I think generally the best way to do these medicines is with, um, you know, good preparation, good integration with people who are really trained. Um, there's a political thing I want to just say that, you know, remember that, you know, because I used these medicines back then uh, and with my friends who are all spiritual seekers without, you know, the context uh, before they were really becoming illegal in the way they became. And so that even without, you know, the best possible training that we have now. Um, many, many people uh, progressed on their spiritual path and on their own using their friends, like sort of like a, a sangha, mm. of friends who were exploring spiritual dimensions, exploring non-ordinary consciousness without the structure of any elders or, or medical establishment. And for the most part, you know, we, you know, we didn't have massive, massive, massive crises with psychedelic being used, you know, in the underground or being used by people. And so, although I do think they really do need to be best used in a um, conscientious, therapeutically well-trained way, it's also good to remember that the people took it in their own hands when these were not available. The miracle of, you know, millions of people doing LSD in the 60s was that people knew there was a truth. People were following on their own something that the government and our medical and psychotherapy institutions hadn't made available. So there's something about the revolutionary nature that humanity has that we're going to, they're going to, people are going to find, even uh. if things are, even things are banished or unavailable, there were still movements of people seeking. You know what I mean? I don't know if this is making sense to you. And no, so that makes, all, yeah, you that makes totally make sense. That's a really important point. And absolutely. And I think I fully support that and people to be able to make their own choices. And I think it's important. That was part of the initiative in Colorado was, decriminalizing psilocybin, but having a place for, um, and I think the the language even mentions indigenous people in it. Um, I forget exactly what it says, but that there can be guides and ceremonies that aren't in the medical establishment, that aren't a trained therapists. And there's a, there should be a place for that. But mm -hmm. I just think with um, part of the cost and negative impact of the war on drugs and Nixon and all that stuff was it's almost like dropping dye in the collective water where these substances and experiences can be seen through a negative light. And I think it's so important to undo that kind of conditioning. Like, of course, anything can be misused and there's, you know, we want to be very careful, but to have this, to advocate for like this view that they, they are medicines, they are healing. And we can, if we approach them in that way, it makes a difference. I guess that's what I'm offering. Definitely. Definitely. It's also important to remember. We get, it's, I wouldn't say sidetracked a little bit. I think the politics are important to remember because things could replay the, again the same way in the future. Um, and that is that, um, what was I going to say? That there was massive false advertising campaigns on TV that were, they were lying to the American people, saying that people were jumping out of windows and there was chromosomal damage for people using LSD. These were blatant lies that were allowed to be used by the media. And, and so we have to remember that the medicines that are sacred that we're, that we're talking about have been so demonized, so misused, and certain communities, particularly communities of color, have been so brutally affected by the way in which these drugs, medicines, sacraments have been um, um, usurped to serve other agendas political, economic, social oppressive agendas that we really need to remember that as we go forward and not be naive about yeah. the way, ways in which, you know, the very same medicine uh, that could kind of help you realize how oppressed you have been in your family, in your culture, in your religion, or, you know, by virtue of, uh, you know, persecution due to your sexual orientation or race, whatever, um, they can also be used um, as political tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, absolutely. We need to remember that. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to be so heavy, but it's always good to remember because there's so much beauty and so much light and so much potential. And there's such a, you know, a hopeful moment right now. We're on the edge of possibly rescheduling MDMA and psilocybin in different states, Australia legalized things. You know, the dominoes will fall when America's policies, which has dominated all the world around drugs. Um, so it's so hopeful. So many people with PTSD are going to get help. So many people. Um, and so I don't in any way want to, you know, um, you know, taint the excitement I have about all the potential and all the healing I've seen in my own life with people. But the shadow is so intense around trauma and psychedelic medicines in the United States and in the world that we cannot forget the past. We're going to repeat it in some way. So that's why. Absolutely. Uh, so so what, you're <laughs> what you're saying is so important. And it's good to have that more of that on this podcast, actually, because they're, it's good, to, you know, good to be positive and look at, but to remember that history and I really wish that we could have more of a national reckoning. Um, I think there's been some efforts to release people from jail, but th it seems like we could do a lot more there. There's still millions of people. I don't know all the numbers right now um, off the top of my head, but people in jail for, you know, for example, marijuana possession, and now it's exactly half the country and it's just, it's absurd. So why, why, why isn't there more of a movement to release them? Um, I think it's right. a little bit, but not enough. Yeah. What, yeah. And what does it say about our society that let's just say, there's some 17 or 18 year old, you know, usually a person of color in Mississippi with one marijuana cigarette that's in jail for 20 years, while millions of mostly white people are making millions of dollars in the marijuana industry. And how is that happening in the same country? How is that possible? But it is, right? There are many people in jail and then being traumatized in jail by, you know, what goes on in jails. I used to work in prisons now being re-traumatized for that one marijuana cigarette, while marijuana millionaires now have huge ability to actually control the psychedelic world because of their money. So you can see the politics and economics should never be forgotten and the inequality of access to these medicines and also the results of uh, the war on drugs were not equally distributed among the population. Mm -hmm. They mostly have affected people of color, predominantly black people and impoverished or people who are underclassed, who didn't have legal representation or who didn't have access to, um, you know, getting out of prison, you know, the way a lot of upper middle class white people do, you know, and so we really have to hold the shadow in light. Um, and there's many yeah. shadow, there's many other shadows I won't get into today. But you know, yeah. as we as we have enthusiasm, if we don't hold the shadow, I feel like we are potentially um, not taking responsible, we will not be responsible about the, the harm that has been done and the harm that still could be done, which gets into the whole other topic of like the training of therapists and the mistakes therapists are already making before psychedelics hmm. come in and the boundary violations that happen on the, you know, because my main commitment is the training of therapists. That's my main goal with my career, the training of psychedelic therapists, the next generation of therapists. And because one of my other specialties, aside from working with PTSD and DID, was working with survivors of therapy trauma. Oh, wow. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. So because, because, so because I have that in my history, I know without psychedelics, what can happen? And it's already happened, both okay. in, the un, in the underground and above ground, when oh. people have access to psychedelics and therapists, for a variety of reasons, let's say there's many motivations, take advantage of or make mistakes and harm people while they're in psychedelic states. And so we also have, you know, I'm sorry that for some reason our conversation has ended up bringing in a lot of the, sh the shadow, and I, I don't know if that's what you planned, yeah. but I was going to make sure we covered. We covered. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting um, to totally go here with you, but it's actually 100% welcome, and I think it's a really valuable thing for the podcast because I've had a lot of therapists and researchers and people in the space, and there's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of research, and we can make these more available. and And you're really doing a good job of speaking to the history and the shadows and um, and the heaviness of that, and yeah, I just, I would love to hear, I mean, how, it seems can like, I ask you, before you yeah. go, Claire, how is it affecting you to hear all this from me? I'm just wondering. Oh, let's just stay. That's let's good. Stay no, that's good. Let me be authentic. Um, there's just a, there's a sense of heaviness and um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm actually having a little bit of that experience that you spoke to earlier, where when something's traumatic, we don't want to look at it, you know, and it's like, oh, I haven't faced some of this stuff in a while. And um, I try to do my part and I, I'm well aware of the history. I love history, but there's, um, and I think this is actually 
can be a valuable part of human psychology. And I see to myself, like, it's good to be optimistic and it's good to have an optimistic view towards the future. And, um, but you're really calling us to like, remember the past and some of it's not even the past, but even that, mm. that negative shadow past war on drugs, mm. it's not that long ago. And there's people in jail right now and their whole world was negatively impacted by events. I mean, obviously in Mississippi and places like that are still going on, but 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, not that long ago. It's not that long ago at all. <laughs> so, right. Right. And, and the, you know, and the paradox also is something like this. So, um, this has to do with what I call money, power, prestige, and privilege, money, power, prestige, and privilege entering the psychedelic world. Hmm. Once upon a time, these medicines were banished, illegal, and demonized. Like 10 years ago, if somebody said they wanted to do research in most institutions in America on any of these things, they would have been laughed out of graduate school, and they would not have been allowed to do a study. Then fast forward even until recently. So, you know, Veronica, Eric, and I, we founded uh, Polaris Insight Center with a couple of other colleagues, and then we ended up becoming more of a training center, and our other colleagues moved on. And so just to give you an example of the, the games in our society, right, four years ago, Veronica and I submitted a one-hour talk, I won't say to what conference, on ketamine-assisted therapy. Completely rejected. Oh. Wanted, wanted no part of it. Hmm. Four, year, four years later, count how many universities around the country are now starting their own psychedelic centers, their own psychedelic clinics, their own psychedelic research centers. Phew. Why? What does that say? So the hypocrisy in our field never ceases to amaze me. You know. Yeah. And so now, because money, power, prestige, and privileges are pouring in to these universities, which are now st filled with people who have no deep, soulful connection to psychedelics but they have money, power, president, prestige, so they're gonna get all these grants. So now they wanna have people come and talk, but it's not really coming from the same motivation that many of us who have been kind of involved in this work for a long time are holding as soul, as soul work and soul healing and kind of revolutionizing mental health. It's coming because there's money, power, prestige, and privilege coming into yeah. academic organizations. Yeah, such a good point. Um, I've been, I just got this book called The Status Game by Will Storr. He was on the Joe Rogan podcast recently. And he, that what, what you're naming money, power, prestige, privilege, he calls status, I think. And um, he just explains so much of human behavior through our need for status. And we play these games and the, and the rules can shift really quickly. You know, when the Nazis mm -hmm. started to come to power in Germany, all of a sudden that was the status. And so that people just shift. And maybe a similar analogy thing, like the cultural tides shift and all of a sudden, yeah, there's all the, yeah, it's just in the status game in part. Yeah, really well put. So now, now psychedelics become high status before they were demonized or considered low status. And we, it's good for us to remember the game, right? Mm -hmm. To have a meta, meta kind of meta awareness of how things can shift um, and how the, the forces that are driving the, maybe some of the forces that are driving the psychedelic movement are not so noble. Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, that's, that's really good to name. Yeah, it's hard to, it, we have we're such a capitalistic society, so the money drives a lot of it, right? But I think the prestige part and the status part, maybe it's even more important. Yeah, on the other side of it, right? So maybe, and for better or worse, maybe it takes that for more people to get access so the the you know the shadow of the shadow is light right mm. and so maybe the fact that you know now all these universities that once spat upon people four or five years ago now that they're going to have research centers there'll be more and more people hopefully who get access to these medicines and maybe in human nature that's just the way it has to go so the good side of all that power prestige and privilege is that some university in arkansas and delaware will now be having psychedelic clinics and research so that people in those communities can get access to the medicines because suddenly it became cool mm -hmm. for psychedelics to be something you study. So like, Maybe okay, even if, okay, if that's the price. <laughs> yeah, even if, and I have a lot of wonderful colleagues in Mississippi and Alabama who are amazing, who are doing breakthrough work, bringing ketamine therapy into those communities against much more odds than we have in California. And so I want to bow to that. People are coming okay. to train with us from the South and they're bringing the medicine back and they're doing amazing things in, in Alabama and Mississippi right now. I like to have a perspective of development, you know, culturally we're moving, you know, idea of progress. And I know not everyone shares that and there's a lot of evidence to not think that, but 
I like to think that we're moving forward and progressing. This is a part of it. So. We are definitely moving forward and we're definitely progressing. And remember, human nature and human history always has a um, two steps forward, one step back. You know, it's, yes. always a, it's always paradoxical. And so whenever there's movement, there's something to undo the movement. And so if we hold awareness of that, I think we can stay on the course and become aware of this other pattern, which tries to like bring things back. For example, like one of the movements is we call it, we joke and call it like um, Prozac 2.0 or 3.0, trying to turn psychedelic therapy into a, a pill mm. that some, some companies are trying to use the biochemistry knowledge we have about psychedelics to turn it into a new pill that you'll take every day. And I'm not even saying that's right or wrong, good or bad, but that will make people will be dependent on the pharmaceutical industry rather than coming for a psychotherapeutic process where they may take, you know, three or four of these medicines over a two-year period with a psychotherapist and do the kind of inner transformational healing that make them completely independent of the pharmaceutical industrial complex. Oh, that's and, a good and so there's two forces coming because there's money invested by many millionaires who want people to have a drug that they take every day so that they can make profit. And what about drugs that people only take 10 times in their lifetime? Hmm. You see what I mean? So I think there's a real clash of uh, motivations. There's a tremendous economic pressure to create products like that, that you take consistently, that you have to subscribe to or keep ordering and keep taking. And yeah, you're right. One, one way I've seen that in the psychedelic space is um, microdosing, which I think can be great. I'm not saying anything against it, but you could, you know, if you're creating a pill, that's your know, little microdose pill, then you got to keep taking it. And that's, you know, so it's a kind of the similar model, perhaps of the pharmaceutical model. I guess it depends on who's, uh, who's distributing and controlling the microdosing medicine and what the research is on, do you have to take it indefinitely or you just take it for periods of time? And, you know, what is the investment of those companies in giving back, for example, to indigenous cultures or to people who uh, are suffering because of the wars on drugs? You know, what's, what's also the motivation to give back? So I think it would be, you know, uh, very specific to where they're coming from to okay. be understood, but you know, you know what I mean? Like what the motivation of, of the people coming up with a microdose pill are. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. There'll be good companies coming out. Um, well, what, one thing you said that piqued my interest was you were working with people like trauma from therapy. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, is it something that's a little bit unfamiliar to you that there's a huge um, number of people who have been traumatized by psychotherapists? And the way I can tell you that it, you can look at your magazine, you know, the MFT magazine that comes out. Yeah, uh, I forgot what it's called. I'm not a psychologist, so I don't have that magazine. But in that particular magazine, I forgot what it's called. At the back, there's all these like pages of people who have um, had their license removed, or oh, uh, you yeah. know what I'm referring to. It's called I, like, call uh, it, like yeah. it's like a professional obituary in a way. It's a, <laughs> but, well, anyway. I, okay, the part that's surprising to me is I, of course, know that that can happen, but I don't know how common it is. I guess I imagine it being a pretty rare thing. It's not rare. I mean, I don't think I have the statistics for you. There's many books been written about it, but um, let's just say that there is a, a variety of ways in which people have been harmed in the mental health system. <laughs> a variety of ways. Um, I won't enumerate all the ways, but they have to do with everything from what happens to people when they're inpatient psych, <laughs> excuse me, to what happens with bad therapists or exploitive, exploitive therapists or therapists who are violating boundaries or sexual, economic, or narcissistic hmm. gain over their clients. And so um, there's a whole population of people who have been harmed by psychotherapy. And because of that, I always teach people when they're doing their intake, uh, and some of them are afraid to speak because they're afraid that therapists won't believe them, or hmm. they're afra or afraid that therapists will take a bias to defend their own against a patient's complaint. Um, or they have so much shame that they have let this, you know, maybe survivors of therapy trauma believe that they caused it or they should have known better or something like that. So there's many reasons why, but um, you know, there's a huge swath of people who have been harmed in a variety of ways by therapists, often through sexual boundary violations. It's terrible. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly worked with a number of people who had a negative impact from being hospitalized, right, against their will or the 72 hour hold or all that kind there's of thing. That, and I've also worked with a large number of people who've been raped in inpatient hospitals by orderlies and other terrible. people. So there's also sexual boundary violations that happen in inpatient psych when people have very uh, little, but also just regular outpatient psychotherapy. If you um, read about it and study about it, there's a lot of people who have survived a massive inappropriate 
uh, therapeutic behavior. And so, you know, one of the reasons, you know, one of my main sort of uh, kind of trying contribution, small though it is, into the field is to teach people about countertransference awareness, countertransference sensitivity, how the therapist needs to understand all the intense feelings that come up in them in the work when psychedelics are added to the mix, mm -hmm. so that the 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 um, let's say the crimes are already going on or the misdeeds are already going on in all the fields of psychotherapy, psychology, psychiatry, everything from misdiagnosis, mismanagement, um, misuse of power, sexual violation, boundary violations, economic exploitation, all these things are go potentially going to be amplified. By, by psychedelics, because psychedelics are nonspecific amplifiers, right? Yes. So we, we know that psychedelics, so if, if something already is going on and it's amplified with therapists not being trained from early on to be aware of all the intense emotions that come up, um, positive and negative with our patients in these fields, then I'm hoping that if that gets built into a psychedelic psychotherapy training from the beginning, we'll have less likely... Uh, you know, malfeasance and mistakes and errors made that really uh, destroy patients' lives. Because to tell you the truth, working with patients who've had therapy trauma on top of family trauma or other trauma, it extends the therapy so long and makes it really mm -hmm. difficult to recover. Because the betrayal, it's like all the people have been betrayed by priests and people in the clergy, like that, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who've had that, right? When your betrayal takes place in the context of people who are trying to help you, right? It's a different kind of trauma than when it takes place in another context, because you're supposed to be able to trust the person and make yourself vulnerable to the person who's helping you. And if that person then, for any of a variety of reasons, exploits you, harms you, violates you, you know, uses you in one way or another. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a, such a betrayal of trust. Um, yeah. On top of the other trauma, it makes it really hard for people to recover. So I'm really hoping that the psychedelic movement, because there's already been, you know, public you probably already know this very public uh, exposure of violations in the psycho psychotherapy I've space. Heard about, I've heard about that, yeah. yeah. And in the underground, both. So it's already happening. And so we really want to be mindful and training therapists yeah. to be aware of what are the things that make this likely to happen. You know? Yeah, it's super important, especially for everyone who's inspired with activism in this space or healing or therapists, like really be careful because, um, yeah, I think there's the potential for I mean, obviously, we don't you don't want that happening anyway. But because it's such a new thing, just becoming legalized, like we don't want um, some big scandal to taint the whole thing and to take away from the potential for healing that's there. And I think it's worth really we get need to be careful. I know that I've heard people talk about it. We talked about it some on this podcast, but it's good to just like, of course, ethics and I mean, ideally, it becoming legalized and all the licensure and all the like, even that magazine you mentioned. Um, all those like checks and balances, safeguards, ways to prevent this from happening. Or if it happens because we're, we're human and things happen, like to, to treat it and to stop it and to, you know, before it gets any worse. And to have systems of repair and systems of um, right. accountability and maybe spaces where we're wise enough now to know that this is going to happen because it's already happened and that we have forums where patients can go to share their story behind you know in front of a group of colleagues and, and where the person who is the accused therapist because not all therapists are guilty of what they're accused of let's say there's also some mm. malicious there has also been malicious lawsuits against therapists that are not valid so i want to cover both sides of that equation but yeah. that there that we create kind of uh not exactly tribunals or courts but you know what i mean kind of professional committees that are really trained in this particular area of of boundaries and ethics and um, the possibilities for a violation and that both therapists and patients can trust that they can come into this form and have meetings where this material is looked at and um, maybe agreements about how the healing needs to happen, including for therapists, therapists being sent back for training or for mandatory, re, you know, mandatory therapy or mandatory uh, revoking of their license for a period of time or forever if the boundary violations were. Mm -hmm. significant enough and also if and i have had some colleagues who've been falsely accused by patients as well if there's a forum where the trained uh, professionals know about the potential for um, false accusations as well that that we get really sophisticated about having spaces where this stuff can get worked out because the whole field could be completely um 
uh, interrupted by a bunch of scandals <clears throat> that happened in the first five years after. Right. That's what I'm trying to, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a colleague who um, was, I believe, falsely accused by a client of theirs, and they went through a whole process with DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, and they had um, this whole process around it, and they were exonerated. And it seemed like it worked well because that particular person crossed boundaries and like even went to their parents' home in a different state, you know, and they're to try to complain about them. And it clearly had their own mental health issues and was just getting very vindictive. And um, but they were spreading it online, which is part of our world today, which can be so hard. So right. there were these exactly. posts online by this disgruntled person and you know, so it was it was hard, hard situation to go through. Exactly. So I guess what we're saying is therapists need to be protected and patients need to be protected. And the history of this needs to be understood and known. And there needs to be a really educated committee created who are fluent in all of this literature and fluent in all of this, um, the potentials, and that we really create a safe space for, that we all know that there is a space to go to with very trained colleagues uh, and patients' rights advocates alike to mediate these really sometimes very confusing situations. You know, sometimes it's very black and white. You know, people have been really exploitative, and other times it's much more nuanced and subtle. And you know, we need to mature, we need to mature as a field to create these um, these spaces for healing. You know, if we're going to add psychedelic substances to our uh, armamentarium, and we've already not handled things well before in terms of <laughs> these uh, problems, then we should really wise up and make sure that as the mature as the field matures, we don't just worry about you know the economics and access we also worry about the possible ill effects to both therapists and patients and do our best to create you know really good training really really solid training around these issues mm -hmm. ethics and counter transference and boundaries and therapists learning what can come up for them mm -hmm. and how to get consultation and how to be part of a, a network of support um because one thing i really believe and i'm sure you would agree is that nobody should do this work alone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everybody should be embedded in a series of supportive consultative relationships. And every patient coming to any one of us should know that their therapist has either a therapist or a consultant and a group that they go to that we're all held. Like those of us who are holding space are held well mm. by others. Yeah. Know, being, being held while holding is what I call it. And that's something I think we have to mature as a field to make sure that no lone wolves are out there doing this work. It's not the kind of work that should be done alone. And just remembering in indigenous cultures, as best as I understand it, this work is always held in community. Hmm. And the, the context of the healing, even if there's a, you know, a shaman working with an individual, there's usually the, the, the community around it that's involved in knowing about the healing and participating. There are safeguards that, you know, in our world, everything is so isolated in little private practices and little bubbles that the psychedelic world cannot flourish that way. It needs to be, you know, intersecting communities of of uh, of support and uh, mature ethical awareness absolutely yeah yeah so many good points one thing it brought up for me and we don't have to spend a lot of time on it but my grad my graduate school did a really good job of emphasizing ethics and boundaries and but it was kind of like there was kind of a fear you know so i kind of graduated with this fear like be very careful and and um i think there's a lot there can be a lot of value in therapeutic touch and yet i feel a lot of hesitation myself because I don't want there to be a boundary issue. Um, but I think, you know, the, I don't know if you have anything to speak to that. Like I've, I think in the maps mm -hmm. thing, like placing a hand on the shoulder or just even holding hands, like in the session, um, can bring up a lot for people. And obviously the, the fear there is that there are therapists in the past or out there who have, who have had violations or violated boundaries who have touched right. it inappropriately. So. Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you a little bit of a wrap on this topic. One of my, not favorite topics because it's really disturbing, but one of the most important topics to talk about, right? Let's say in the past, there's been like two like bookend problems, right? One is that um, there was so much random violations that went on even during Sigmund Freud's era, right? People were having sex with their clients and all kinds of things that were never, you know, documented. And um, on the other end is that people became so frightened of any kind of boundary violation that, you know, even offering a patient a tissue or hugging them or shaking their hand became this huge yeah. anxiety thing, right? So that's like what happened in the history of psychotherapy. Now we have psychedelic psychotherapy coming in and 
the issue of touch is very important in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy as we teach it. Like we, you know, we teach this both at MAPS and through Polaris. You know, there's three types of touch to be really simple, right? There's safety touch, there's there's supportive touch, and there's therapeutic touch. And I can talk about each of those touches in a second, but there's no way not to have touch in psychedelic assisted therapy. I always say, we always say jokingly and playfully, uh, safety touch is mandatory because we have to have people, you know, not fall off the bed. We have to help people to the bathroom or mm. there's certain basic elements of touch that do not exist in regular psychotherapy. So everybody who's training to become a psychedelic therapist must be trained in the ethics and awareness about touch and of these three types of touch. Now, the first type of touch is not negotiable. If you came into me and said, I don't want to be touched at all, then I'm saying like, I, we can't work with you. Because mm. we might we might have to help you not fall off the bed. We mm. might have to help you keep safe if you're flailing around. And we might have to help you get to the bathroom. And even if you've had a lot of... So that's one type of touch that's mandatory. So everybody has to be trained in safety touch. And then there's something called supportive touch, which is, you know, holding your hand, putting a hand on the shoulder, you know, various forms of helping people stay with their process. That, and of course, every patient can refuse that and decide not to have that. And there's many, many books and things written about negotiating touch and whether people can change their mind once they're on an, on, uh, in an altered or non altered state of consciousness, which we mostly agreed in our field, they cannot change their mind in the middle of an, a session. If they said, do whatever, ever hold my hand during the intake and prep, and then all of a sudden in the middle of a psychedelic session, they say, yes, I want you to hold my hand. We can't really do it. Hmm. So we have to review that again in the next session and say, okay, maybe in the next session we can, but we can't do anything you have not agreed to. But safety touch is something they can't disagree to. Hmm. Good. That's Support, good. Supportive touch, they can say yes or no about. And then therapeutic touch is more complicated. That involves like, you know, pushing and kicking and screaming and using various forms of touch to help people do release work. And that should only be done by people who have some training in it. But we always introduce, there's three types of touch in all the intakes and prep work we do with ketamine and with MDMA, and hopefully they're doing it with psilocybin. And that, you know, these can all be optional except safety touch. And that means that people have to unlearn all of their inhibitions around touch coming from regular psychotherapy, coming into psychedelic therapy training. And we all spend quite a bit of time, both in the MAPS protocol of training and in, in, in Polaris, teaching people about, not only about the different types of touch, but what does that bring up for you? You know, how does it, how is it for you to know that you're going to have to do some kind of hands-on work? Or how does it feel that you've been told for 20 years, don't ever hold a patient's hand. Mm. And now you're going to be maybe holding their hand as part of a process and learning when not to hold their hand and learning all the subtleties about how touch can be an intrusion or about how touch can be a facilitating part of the process and how your own anxieties about touch or your own feelings about it. So it's such a complicated area that I'm excited about is now included in the curriculum because in regular psychotherapy, it's easy to say, no, no touch. But in psychedelic assisted therapy, if we say that we're really depriving the therapeutic relationship of, of a number of really important elements that can make a huge difference. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's great to, to share and, and think about and have here. And um, I think it's, yeah, again, evolving. Because um, there's, yeah, it makes so much sense. I like that. I haven't heard those three types of touch before exactly, but I really like that. Um, let's see, I wanted to ask you while I have you, and um, I realize we don't have a ton of time, but you said you also have specialized in disassociation, dissociative identity disorder. Yeah, I have yeah, many, many decades of specializing in the treatment of uh, survivors of extreme abuse, which usually ends up categorized under one of the diagnoses of uh, either complex PTSD or dissociative identity disorder or some of the dissociative disorders. Mm. <clears throat> and I mean, disassociation, it's such a tricky thing in my experience to work with and track and um i think like a lot of these things we're talking about it's on a spectrum so someone with extreme trauma you know is, is going to be different but that we, we all have you know times where we disassociate and um do you have any yeah just thoughts reflections to share about that and how therapy can help how psychedelic therapy could help with that i mean with with some like ketamine for example classically was called a disassociative so it's, it's surprising to people to learn that it could help them associate to their body to exactly their body. exactly one of the great paradoxes of ketamine is it's a dissociative that can help you reassociate. But um, I mean, you know, it's funny when somebody like you asked me a question like this, and it happens sometimes in training, 
I almost feel like I'm the wrong person to ask because I have an encyclopedia in my head about dissociative <laughs> because I've studied it my whole life. Right. And so how do, how do I take an ocean of a question and put it into a little bit of a, a yeah. thimble answer? But the best I'll try to do it for a couple of minutes is just to say, you know, in general, dissociation is a, you know, whether you want to call it, you know, God-given or biologically given or both capacity of the human psyche that serves so many functions from, you know, uh, from survival to extreme torture and trauma to also kind of creativity, spiritual work, transformation, and, you know, everything from daydreaming and, you know, coming up with solutions from daydreaming or art and poetry are sometimes written in dissociative states. Uh, so states of mind that are, you know, loosened up from the hyper compartmentalization of normal life. And, uh, you know, so we're continuing from daydreaming on one end uh, to like polyfragmented dissociative identity disorder on the other end, where we have a hundred different personalities with a hundred different names doing a hundred different things who don't know about each other. And so we have this kind of capacity of mind. And then we have this idea of a compartmentalization, right? Because you can have dissociation without hyper compartmentalization. And so, you know, um, like a lot of people who are trans channelers in Brazil, who practice Spiritismo, which is a religion, are, you know, they're good at dissociating from the rigidity of the reform, and then they can kind of go into trance and bring messages back for the community from a spiritual nature. So we have these beautiful, spiritually positive meanings of the word dissociation. Um, and then we have this kind of confusion about the word because it's used in so many kinds. And then we have severe trauma-based dissociation, mm. which is, you know, the human psyche's adaptation to trauma, which is being overwhelmed and then compartmentalizing parts of the experience so that you're not completely obliterated by the experiences. So the human capacity disconnects and then compartmentalizes, you know, the emotion, the meaning, the somatics into different places of the psyche until which time they can sometimes be brought back together or not. And so we have this huge continuum of dissociation, yeah. right? So that's the general idea, right? From like, very, and then we have psychedelic induced dissociation, yeah. which confuses everyone even more, right? Because it's a different type of dissociation, even if it uses the same principle the psyche has to, to disconnect. So just to be really simple, right? With ketamine, there's two types of dissociation. Since you're familiar with ketamine, I'll use just ketamine for now, right? So low-dose ketamine, psycholytic dose ketamine, mm -hmm. helps people dissociate. So this is benevolent dissociation, right? And chosen, but it's not a traumatic-based dissociation that's happening as survival. It's like you choose to take this medicine in order to work on something. And in a low dose, all of a sudden, you're dissociated from your ruminative mind, your obsessions. You're, you're no longer merged with, so you're disconnected from old belief patterns, old ideas, and you're loose, and you can observe them. I'm not, you're, you're no longer merged with them, or you're unblended, to use a, a term from ACT, right? So you're unblended, and you're dissociated in this benevolent way from all the rigidities of your personality. And because of that, you can do all this work. You're sort of in a, in a trance state, which EMDR can do as well as other, you know, shamanic drumming. And then we have psychedelic-based association. You still with me on this? Yeah, so, like, yeah. so it's easy to talk about psychedelic. So psychedelic dissociation is you're no longer connected to yourself as a biographical entity limited by the name Julian Royce. Mm. So Julian is now a particle of infinite consciousness surfing the field of consciousness, mm. having a journey <laughs> and going wherever you're going to go. But Julian is no longer just Julian. Julian is part of everything, part of this. Julian may be talking. So you're now dissociated from the limitation of your biographical identity. Mm, yeah. And so that's another form of dissociation associated with psychedelic dosing. And so we have this word dissociation that means all these different things depending on the context. And some of it is survival-based, some of it's creativity-based, some of it's spiritual-based. And with these chemicals, these sacraments, it's actually a benevolent um, reliever of constriction and limitation and mm. you know helps us unmerge from limited states of identity, belief, and consciousness. So Julian will realize on a psychedelic journey, he's so much more than Julian Royce. Julian has contacted three ancestors, four previous lifetimes. He was a redwood tree. He, you know, um, realized that any limited thought of who he was is now a joke. 
and he's expanded his consciousness beyond any limited. You've dissociated from the, what I call DNA skin suit of mm -hmm. Julian Royce. And then you come back into Julian from having been everything. Okay. And that's a form of, you know, psychedelic dissociation that's so beneficial and transformative. So that same word, dissociation. I love that. <laughs> so yeah, the same word, the big spectrum, like you said, and it was so helpful to hear you articulate different types, even daydreaming. That's like, of course, a kind of disassociation and uh, tends to have such a negative connotation, I think, especially in somatic therapy. You know, it's all about, we want to be in our body. We want to be spiritual teachings. We always be present, be here now. And to actually honor the spectrum of experience and it's not necessarily negative or positive it could you know obviously it could be a trauma symptom but it could be like you just said it could be an amazing experience it could be a spiritual experience it could be expanding your identity um yeah that's how about, how about if i say something even more radical than what you said which is okay. it's it's always positive okay. what i mean by what i mean by that because it's been it's been misunderstood it's been degraded it's been mostly it's misunderstood but that Everybody who's using dissociation, for whatever reason, should be respected in the moment or for the fact that they've used dissociation to survive or cope. And so let's say you're in a bodywork session and you're dissociating, and then you feel now ashamed that you're dissociating right. because you're not supposed to be dissociating, you're supposed to be present. And now you feel shamed either by yourself or by the culture or by the training program or by the therapist. Like, why aren't you being present? You're dissociating. But what if? There's always a meaning oh, to the explanation of why somebody's dissociating and that there's value in it and something to be explored. And if you shame it or pathologize it, not only is everybody going to feel worse who is doing it, but we're going to lose respect for a beautiful defense that's been there for a reason, usually for psychological survival, mm -hmm. usually for protection against horrific, overwhelming experience, or in the positive sense, for creativity or spiritual connection. Or in that moment, maybe you're not feeling safe. Maybe... You can't be present because you don't feel safe. And why can't we explore the unsafety you're feeling without pathologizing dissociation? Mm -hmm. why, can't we, why can't we honor, like, maybe there's something okay about feeling unsafe in this moment to be present? And mm -hmm. so in that way, I would say all dissociation should be called uh, depathologized, should be respected and honored, and become something that we respect and explore and not ever judge as inappropriate even though it causes a lot of problems for people who do it all the time. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that's well said. That's so, you know, it brings to mind, I haven't experienced this from a therapist that I'm remembering, you know, to their credit, but I definitely, I was in a coaching program and it was um, definitely had like cult-like dynamics or some people called it a cult in retrospect, but I remember getting this coaching session and they would do it in front of the big group of people, which was part of what wasn't always helpful in their approach. And, and probably damaging to a lot of people, but then they would say like, oh, where did you go? And the disassociation, they were good at noticing it and naming it, but it was definitely shamed and it was the opposite of what you're sharing. So it's good to hear that. And that's, that's a beautiful approach to share, to not shame it and not, and it's not, it's not, 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 not negative and it's happening for a reason. I think there's, there's really something there. Yeah. I think we need to really reframe our complete understanding of dissociation at every level. And uh, it's, one of my other, it's one of my other many missions in the field as a, as a teacher. <laughs> Interesting. That's a, great, that's a great thing to share about. And yeah, I think a lot of well-meaning teachings, perspectives, practices, spiritual teachings, you know, be here now, that kind of thing. Like, of course, it's helpful, but then it can become kind of rigid and kind of used to shame something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One of, my, one of my favorite slides in one of the trainings I do for Polaris is Dharma, not dogma. Hmm. meaning like as we develop the psychedelic field as we really move into a later mature phase let's make sure we don't become dogmatic let's keep adding to the dharma let's keep adding to what we know and our main teachers are always our patients or our clients let's never forget that and let's keep adding to what we're learning and never become too much like tribalist like emdr therapists or dbd therapists or a psychoanalyst that our field is so balkanized and so divided historically and people think they know the right way to do things and I think, I hope that the psychedelic movement as it matures can really become a space of cross-pertilization, cross-pollinization, non-rigidity. And so I always say, dharma, not dogma. Mm, Evolving the dharma of psychedelic therapy, a hundred years from now, they'll benefit from all the things that we're learning and it'll stay open and it will not become like, this is the only way to do it. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, okay. field, the field of therapy is super balkanized and I've complained about that. And it's partly economic reasons where if I develop my own little thing and trademark it, you know, everyone's doing that. So um, then there's a million different specialties and a million different modalities. And um, it's partly, it's partly that it's all partly that, but it's also like I was a little kid growing up in New York city. Right. And there were two teams, the Mets and the Yankees, and you had to like one or the other. And I, was a, I was a Mets fan. My whole family was a Mets fan. And we really didn't like people who were Yankee fans. And so I just think there's something in human nature, unfortunately, mm -hmm. something tribalistic where we you know, want a team to root for. And so, yes, there's economic reasons. But, and people put a lot of years into study to become a psychoanalyst or a Jungian analyst. And so they are affiliated with that, that worldview. So, but I think there's something that's not so great in human nature that makes yeah. us want, want to like pick a side, pick a team, root for something, cheer for something against something else. And um, I think that's wired into us, unfortunately. Yeah. And so it's all yeah. it also goes back to that, you know? <laughs> I think we're evolved and wired to, to be tribalized. And to go back to that book, The Status Game, he shares a psychological study where they took a bunch of people in a big room and then they, um, I don't know, I talked to him for a little bit. And then they said, we're going to divide you up into two teams. And we're just, we're going to flip a coin here. You're going to either be team, you know, heads or tails. And then they would do that. And they kept them, once they had separated them for a little bit, then they would go and talk to each team. And they say, so what do you think about um, team red over there? And the blue team would be like, uh, they're not as smart as us. They're not quite as good looking. And, uh, and they knew, they had just witnessed the coin flip. So they knew it's completely arbitrary. And yet that dynamic still started to happen minutes after they were divided up. Right. And of course, you know, the more extreme versions of this research, right? The Stanford prison, right, right. Yeah. Where, where you're going to be the prisoner, I'm going to be the guard, and then we're going to play this game. You know, and so the, all the social psychology research also showed that this particular, you know, I would say flaw in human nature can be really exacerbated into some really awful things as we know in world history. Oh, so yeah. we, we go from like, I like the Mets, and I don't like the Yankees to, you know, CBT therapy is better than Jungian therapy. To, <laughs> to like, you know, one race is better than the other race, to the United States is the best country. You know, you know, we get into these extreme, and I'm really hoping, I think my big prayer really, you know, especially as, as coming into my elder years, is that the psychedelic movement becomes a movement of, of, of increasing fl fluid dharma, not dogma, and constantly being taught by our patients what works, what doesn't work, and that we get together and we're constantly growing and being surprised and learning something new, and that we keep our humility and our innocence always handy and that we're uh, always learning something new and that we never think we've nailed it. We never think we figured it all out and that we're an evolving body of wisdom and knowledge um, into the future. That's my wish for the psychedelic movement. Mm, beautiful. I love that. Oh, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Um, do you have any, any mm -hmm. last words for us? Uh, you know, my last words, believe it or not, so I think my last words, it's good for me to end on the, the note of my prayer for the psychedelic yeah. world, but I, I want to just check in with you um, and how you're doing about what we talked about, because we didn't know what we we're going to talk about. And I am concerned a little bit that we ended up in a more shadow territory than I had planned or you planned. And I just want to see how your how it is, how it's affected you, how our talk has affected you. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think this was, I think this was really good. And um, I think it's good for me on a personal level. And I I think it'll be good for the listeners and just in terms of the arc of the podcast for what it's worth to have, to bring more of that voice in is actually really needed. And I hadn't been thinking that or as aware of that as I should have been. Um, I have had some activists and some people of color in the podcast, but I could do a lot more, but to really speak to those shadow sides in the way you did felt really, felt really touching. And the hearing you talk about disassociation, like I'm going to actually listen to that section again, because that, is something that I want to understand better. And I appreciated the way you shared about that. Yeah. So, you're, so you're not unduly stressed by our conversation? Uh, I'm not unduly stressed. I am humbled and sometimes feels like damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, I think like a lot of people in the world of mental health and therapy, I, you know, coming from a place of wanting to help people, wanting to be of service and, um, and then running into all the economic pressures and the status games and, recognizing that's true for me too, you know, and, um, I would be, I wouldn't be honest if I, if I said it wasn't. And so <laughs> to try to, you know, maybe there's a way to make these things more conscious and play with them in a way that they can be in alignment with helping the greater good. That's, that's my hope. Um, but I think it's good to just, I like, I like that. I like yeah. what you just said, how to make them in alignment with the greater good. Like knowing we have these propensities, we have these tendencies as human beings, how do we 
make them work for the greater good. For yeah. The, for the yeah. Good. So we're not going to get rid of them, you know? And I don't we, think so. Like, yeah. We're, monkey, we're monkeys. We have, we're monkey. monkey, we have the, the, we have the DNA of, of, of primates. So. Yeah. There's this phrase that I, I love that rattles around in my head of we're, we're just bipedal great apes wandering around. And I'll think that when I'm like out and about. It's, like, it's true. It's just, we're big apes and we have, we walk on two feet, but we're still animals. And I think there's been, I have a lot of background with Buddhism and there's problems everywhere you look, but there, there is ways in which we can leverage these things to the greater good. Like, you know, if you're in a meditative community, there, there could be, there's some status. Oh, that person has done four years of retreat. That person's done three years of retreat. And that can become its own problem. But in theory is if retreat is a good thing, then you know, they're being motivated by that status game in a good way, perhaps. So. Exactly. And I do think, you know, of all the system, all the religious systems in the world try to address the issue of uh, virtue and what's the opposite of virtue, virtue and. Um, we don't want to say sin. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. Error. Let's just say virtue error. and error, virtue and dysfunctional pattern. There's a word. I can't think of what it is in, in Buddhism, particularly. Um, but I feel like the Buddhist tradition has really attempted to uh, include the shadow. Mm -hmm. in a really especially tibetan buddhism in a really beautiful way making room for it including it narrating it and um not vilifying or demonizing it but making it known that if you're going to have a healthy spirituality you have to have a relationship with the light and the shadow and be in constant dialogue within yourself and within the community about how those two things are possibly falling out of alignment out of balance because one can really fertilize the other and when they come into new forms of intersection there's great art usually great art and great breakthroughs that come from that, you know? So uh, I yeah. hope also that the psychedelic world will benefit from, you know, a mature relationship with shadow and light. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I'm reflecting on from our conversation is there's this famous quote from Thich Nhat Hanh that the future Buddha will be the Sangha, will be the community. Yes. The, the value of community, because that's the only way to balance this stuff out. If it's a very, cult of personality, it's going to eventually blow up or lead to a lot of trauma or abuse, right? So we have to have a community to hold it. Exactly. That's one of my favorite sayings of his, by the way. And so we can even say that this podcast and you and I are in our two-person sangha, right? Mm. Um, regardless of the age difference between us, or regardless of like, I have more experience in some things than you do, and you have more experience than I do, that we're equal, that we're equal. Mm. And that the future Sangha is a bunch of people who are equal ascending into collective consciousness and healing together mm -hmm. without pathological hierarchy and without particular experiences being used for power over the other. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's a good vision for the future. Yeah. 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 So thank you for inviting me. I don't do very many podcasts, believe it or not. And thank you. I'm glad I persevered. Yeah. Yeah. You and um, yeah. Um, Let's do this again sometime. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'd love to. Thanks so much for being on that. Thank you. And um, after it's over, whatever, wherever it is, um, we have a monthly newsletter, which you should subscribe to, called the Polaris Pulse, which is a monthly newsletter from our um, clinic. And we have poems in it and other things. And I would love for the podcast to be linked there so people could listen to this. And you'll, oh, you have, We have thousands of people who receive our, and I would love for your work to be uh because I've read, I've heard some of your podcasts. And I really like them. Oh, so some, somehow, if there's a way you would send me the link, I'll send it to our team, and I'll put it on the um, the next Polaris Pulse. And however, however we decide to title this, um, um, and then that'll also serve your your work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'll link I'll link stuff in the show notes with the episode. And yeah, we'll definitely do that. So. Yeah, it must be an easy way. Like you'd send me something, and I could just send it on to them, and they could right one of those yeah. like, live link things, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're good. So make sure you do that. And uh, many blessings on your work. Till we meet again. Thank you.